Hey, we're excited that you are here as well. And everyone joining us online from wherever you are, what do you say, church? Let's welcome them. Come on, make some noise for them. Let's go. We're excited that you're here as well. We're in part three of a series that we're calling Legacy, and we're studying the book of Nehemiah. How many even knew Nehemiah was in the Bible? You know what I mean? So, so we're studying one of those books that maybe doesn't get a lot of attention to the average, you know, church-going Christian, uh, um, average person, but it's just packed with so much truth and principles. And we're titling this series Legacy because Nehemiah did something amazing, man. He, he left the comfort of, pal- of, the, of a palace and a great career, great retirement, all this stuff. And he left all of that to go help rebuild Jerusalem. His heart was for God's people and God's kingdom. And, and he was the guy, man, who rebuilt and was the leader of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days where others failed for years and years and years. They tried to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem under Nehemiah. In 52 days, it got, it got accomplished. Several weeks ago, three weeks ago, we started a 52-day campaign to not just rebuild the church and the, the, the kids' center that we're doing over there, and I'll talk to you guys about that in a little bit, but 52 days of rebuilding our life and our faith. And I believe that this is a rebuilding season that many people are in, that, that the enemy has, a, has done a lot of damage, attacked homes and marriages and and our faith, and our health, and, and over this last, I don't know, maybe a year, two years, just in this time frame, there's been so much damage done to those proverbial walls in our, in our own lives, and I believe that, that we're in a rebuilding season, and so three weeks ago, we said we're going to take 52 days, and we're going to believe that God is going to do a supernatural work, a breakthrough in those walls that have been broken down. I'm talking to the marriages that have been broken, relationship with children and families that that have been broken, and maybe even our faith and our spiritual walk has been tested and broken and fallen apart, that in 52 days, we are going to see a supernatural rebuilding of the walls in our life. Can I get an amen, church? Come on. We're believing that, and I'm praying that over, over your life, man. And Nehemiah is the perfect person to study this legacy. What is legacy defined? The definition of legacy for this series is what you leave when you leave. And a lot of times we don't think about that. We don't, we're thinking about what we're building, not what we're leaving. And this is what, what caused Nehemiah to make the shift, to make the trade of what he was building on this earth to what he would leave for God's kingdom. It was a no-brainer to him to put aside his career and, and, and what he was doing in, in the kingdom of Persia to go advance God's kingdom and help, and help God's people because he wanted to leave a godly legacy. Okay, we're going to study Nehemiah chapter 4 today. I'm actually going to study the entire chapter and break it down for you. Who's here, who here loves your Bible? Does anyone here love your Bible in this room? All right. We're going, to, we're going to dig in, and there's a lot of truth in Nehemiah chapter 4. Let me read you the first verse, and I'm going to tell you where we're going. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, it says, When Sambalot heard that we were, say, rebuilding. That's what we're doing, man. We're rebuilding some walls in our life. When Sambalot, when the enemy heard that they were rebuilding, he became angry. Um, and was greatly incensed. Here's the truth I want you to see, you guys, that every time you start building for God, you're asking for a battle. Today's, the, the, ta- the title of today's sermon is How to Handle Opposition. Because when you start this rebuilding thing, now let me kind of, let me explain that just real quick, because the enemy, the devil does not mind you building a retirement. He doesn't mind you building a business. He doesn't mind you building financial security, building riches. He doesn't mind you doing any of that. He takes particular um, um, uh, offense to you building for God. When you start building, so when you start, listen to me, when you start saying, I'm going to build a godly marriage, man. I'm going to turn some things around. You're going to get a battle. We say, I'm going to start building a godly family. We're going to fix them. Hey, we're going to change some things, family. The enemies that now you're ready for it. You're getting a battle on that front, okay? When you start saying, I'm going to build some, I'm going to be a part of this kingdom work. I'm going to help build God's kingdom and build, God, build God's church. You are asking for battle because the devil does not like God's church to be built. The devil does not. There is a strategic attack, opposition 
a scheme of opposition against your legacy. The enemy does not want you leaving a legacy or impacting the kingdom of heaven. Every time you start building for God, you're asking for battle. I told you last week, there is no opportunity without opposition. There is none. So one of the greatest tests of your legacy is how you handle the opposition. One of the greatest tests, because it's going to come. The battle's going to come. How you handle that opposition is going to be the greatest test of your legacy. What do you do? How do you handle it? Do you, do you get discouraged? Do, do you panic under pressure? Do you get uptight? Do you lose your temper? Do you blow up? Do, do you get discouraged, shrink back, and give up? What do you do? Because if you want to leave a kingdom, I'm talking about kingdom legacy and a godly legacy, then in the job description is a battle. You are going to have attacks and battle to leave a kingdom legacy. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we see the tactics of the opposition and how he handled it. I want to show you both of those things today. I want to show you the tactics of the opposition against Nehemiah in this chapter. And they're the same tactics that you and I will have to face a lot of times in the opposition to rebuilding and leaving a legacy. But then we're going to talk about how to handle this thing, man, okay? How many of you ready for this? You want to see it? Come on. Okay, what are the tactics to, to, that the enemy is using in opposing your legacy, in opposing you, rebuilding. Write it down. I'm gonna give you three of them in the text. Number one, I'm gonna give it to you, then I'm gonna show you the text. The first one is ridicule. That's the first tactic we see used from the enemy. The opposition is ridicule. The world continually ridicules the church, puts it down and argues and makes fun of God's people. We're characterized as weak or as ignorant or fanatical people. All pastors are wimps or crooks. It's like the, it's a continuous and constant ridicule. And you know why this is so effective? Well, this one in particular, the enemy likes to use and your enemies and people like to use against us, ridicule. It's effective because it attacks your self-worth. See, a lot of us can, we can put up with a lot except ridicule. When ridicule starts coming, that's, that's where it really attacks the, our identity and our core. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 4, continuing with verse 2. It says, He, Sambalot, now he ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria. R ridicule is always a substitute for reason. When, listen, when your enemy cannot reason you out of your position, he will try to ridicule you out of your position. And when people ridicule you, really what, what it is, most of the time, they are afraid of you succeeding. So they're going to so ridicule you because they're afraid of your success. So then he even resorts to name calling. He goes, what are these feeble Jews, these, these little tiny people, what are they doing? Will they restore the wall? He says, will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? That's not even what they said they were going to do. He's just kind of over-exaggerating what's happening just to try to bait them in an argument. He's trying to distract them from what they're doing and get them fighting a different battle. Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubbles, burned as they are? And then it says this, I love this. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was, he was standing at his side. See, ridicule is contagious. So Sambalot, check this out. The Bible is funny, man. When you read the Bible, you got to read it with some humor because I want you to see this picture. Sambalot is like making fun of the Jews and name calling them. And, and he's got this sidekick, Tobiah, who, who, because ridicule is so contagious, there's some people who won't start the ridiculing, but when someone else starts ridiculing, they'll start echoing. Those people are cowards, right? They won't ridicule, they won't lead the way in ridicule, but when someone else starts it, th so this is Tobiah, okay? Tobiah's like in the shadow of Sambalot. He's the guy going, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay, so look what he says. It's so corny. He's like, he, he's at his side. He, he says, what are they building? Even a fox climbing on it would break down their wall of stones. Isn't that a good one, guys? Good one, huh? huh. Isn't that a good one? I'm telling you, you just got to read the Bible with a little bit of humor here. This dude's, okay, here's, this is a tactic of op, uh, the opposition against you, though. The enemy and your enemies wants to ridicule you. Here's the second one, and that's resistance. Write it down, resistance. See, leaving a legacy, listen to me, church, leaving a legacy is not going to be easy, but it will be worth it. You will, you will face resistance to rebuilding 
what God has called you to rebuild, what was broken. You will face some resistance here. Look what it says in verse 6. So we, we, we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached what? Half its height. I want you to just file that away. We're going to come back to that. Reach half its height. For the people worked with what? All their heart. Listen to me, guys. If you want to leave a legacy, you're not going to win this battle if this is a part-time battle. This, this, this thing, this rebuilding that you're rebuild, rebuilding, it's going to take all of your heart, all of your focus, all of your energy. And I understand that there are other priorities in your life, and this has got to get taken care of, and that's got to get taken care of. But what Nehemiah is saying here is this rebuilding thing, God's purpose, God's destiny for my life, leaving a legacy, it took priority. We gave it our full heart and full attention. We didn't divide our heart. And look, if you divide your heart, if you don't give this thing your full heart, when you do face resistance, it's so easy to shift over the other things that you're giving your heart to. It's so easy. So you got part of your heart over here in your career or in this world or in, in other things. So when you get resistance to the godly thing that you're trying to build, because that's what the enemy is going to attack you on, it's just really easy to go, that's okay, I can win over here. I'll just win at work if I can't win at home. So I'll just stay late and keep building this thing because I'm successful here and I'm a winner here and I'm respected here. So I'll just stay here because here there's too much resistance. Come on, are you hearing me here, guys? So, so you will face resistance and then you got to work at it with all your heart. But when Sambalot, it says, when Sambalot, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod, Ashdod, heard that all the repairs of Jerusalem's walls, they, they'd gone ahead, even though, he says, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry, and they all, look what they did, they plotted together. I want you to circle that or something in your notes, man. See, the opposition now is getting organized. It's no longer a couple critics, now we got a conspiracy, right? Now they're, they're rallying, the Sambalot has gathered all the, disgrun the, the, the disgruntled parties, and they're resisting the Jewish people now rebuilding the wall. So Sambalot and the Samaritans, I want you to see this, you guys. Sambalot and the Samaritans, they're in the north. The Arabs that he's talking about, they're in the south. Tobiah and the Ammonites, they're in the east. And Ashdod were in the west. The Jews were surrounded, surrounded on all fronts by these people conspiring against them. Have you ever noticed that negative people tend to gravitate together? Isn't that crazy? How, how like the haters tend to find each other? It's like, how in the world did they all, all my haters show up in the same room? How in the world? You scroll into Instagram and you say, what in the world? How did they find each other? You know what I'm How did all the negative, all the haters, like they just have a way of finding each other and their purpose was to fight and to stir up trouble. Here's what I, I want you guys to, to understand. Just because you, just because there is resistance doesn't mean you're on the wrong path. See, some of you need to stop choosing the path of least resistance because no one ever left a legacy in their comfort zone. You need to get out of your comfort zone and, and, and actually push up against some of that resistance, even if I'm attacked at every direction, even if I'm taking it from the north, south, east, west, financial, relational, emotional, physical, I'm gonna work at this thing with all of my heart. Oh, my heart. Okay, so here's the, the opposition that, that they were facing, that we have to face ridicule, okay? Resistance, here's the third one, that they were up against rumors. Rumors. The quickest way to spread a rumor is to feed on people's fears. Here's the gist of the rumor that they were up against, the Jewish people. That the, it sounded something like this. Oh, you're gonna get it from all sides. Oh, we're gonna attack you and crush you and there's nothing you can do about it. You won't even know what hit you. We're gonna come at you so hard. But the, the reality was, they didn't even have enough power to do what they were threatening to do. But the rumor of the attack was enough to incite panic. Sometimes it's just, just the fear of failure can get you to stop, can get you to quit, can get you to give up in rebuilding and building the, and leaving the legacy. Rumor is often used by opposition. Look at Nehemiah 4 again. Let's go back to the text. Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, before they know what's happening, we'll swoop down on them and kill them and 
in their work. And then it says this. The Jews who live near the enemy, I want you to see a couple characteristics, two characteristics in this text about rumors. Okay, here's the first one. They're always spread by those closest to the enemy. The Jews who live near the enemy. See, there were Jewish people who did not live in Jerusalem, but they were actually lived near the enemy. They were the ones who were the most negative. What happens when you're around negativity often? You become negative. You get infected with that negativity and that critical spirit because you're, you're just in it constantly. And the point is here that Satan, if Satan can get somebody inside the camp saying it can't be done, then he's already won a victory. So, so sometimes you, you're, you're effective in removing yourself from the enemy, the distance from the enemy, but you also have to be careful of who you're letting in your proximity that has the enemy's ear. Because rumors are often sp spread by, by the people closest to the enemy. And he says, they came and told us again and again. What happens when you listen to a rumor again and again? Oh, that's the second characteristic about a rumor right there. It exaggerates the more you listen to it. It grows the more you listen to it. Now, the more I listen to that thing, the more I actually start to believe it. So here's the, the effect of the opposition. In verse 10, it shows us now the opposition has taken effect in the people. It says, then the people of Judah began to complain. Here's what they said. Oh man, the workers are getting tired. This is hard. There's so much rubble to be moved and we'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. See, when you're working hard and you're bombarded with ridicule and rumors and resistance, you're going to get discouraged. Will you write that? That's the effect of opposition. Write that down somewhere, discouragement. That is the enemy's attempt here. He's trying to remove courage from your life where, where God wants you. Like in Joshua chapter one, he says, be strong and courageous. I am going with you. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be, 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 be afraid. Believe in God, believe also in me. See, the enemy wants to take your courage away from you. You know when, you know when discouragement is most often like at its peak? When it's most often to occur and you're, you're, you're like feeling the effects of discouragement in the rebuilding process, we read it in verse six. It says they rebuilt the wall up to what? Halfway. Discouragement is at its peak. This is what I felt when I read this. This is what the Lord told me. Discouragement is strongest when you're halfway there. Do you know where we're at today in this 52-day campaign? We're 21 days exactly today. Here's what the Lord told me when I was studying this. Some of you are feeling the effects of discouragement. Your courage, your courage is being, because of the attack, the oppression, the resistance, the ridicule. Like, like, and you're feeling the effect of the discouragement so much right here, right now. What, is the, what are the effects here, the causes of discouragement? Here's what some of you are feeling. The first, write them down real quick, is fatigue. Some of you are tired at this point. Here's what they said. They said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. Man, I've been working at this thing and, it's, and now it's getting, it's getting hard. We're feeling the effect of it. Here's the next one, frustration. We're now it's like, well, 21 days, like you, we start with so much joy, right? You started 52, come on, we're gonna rebuild this thing. We're gonna, we're gonna get to work, man. We're gonna fix our marriage and I'll come on kids and, and I'm gonna do it for the kingdom. And at a halfway point, you're like, will this ever get better? Is it ever gonna change? Here's what they said, there's just so much rubble. You know, frustration is a matter of perspective. The reality was there, the pile of rubble was not growing, it was actually shrinking. And I'm here to tell you today, listen to me, your marriage is better now than it was 21 days ago, in Jesus' name. Your faith is stronger now than it was 21 days ago. Your family is better now than it was 21 days ago. Don't give up halfway. Don't let the enemy take your courage. The, like we, we, we get fatigued and frustrated. Here's the third one, is failure. Here's what they said. We'll never be able to build the wall. See, when you're tired, everything looks impossible. Some of you are at the halfway point and you're like, I'm, I don't think I can build this. Maybe it's not even meant to be built. Maybe this is just the way, this is, the, this is what it is, man. 
Vince Lombardi, he said this. He said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And you're tired, and some of you, I just, I just sense it in my spirit. Some of you are tired, and you're halfway. Like you started with the right vision and the right faith, but right now, because of the opposition that you're up against, you're, you're tired, you're frustrated, you're looking at it with failure. Here's the last one, number four. Fear is a cause of discouragement. They said the enemies are going to attack us from every angle. Now look, the, the opposition, like the, the strategic plan of the enemy against your life, there are two goals. He just wants to do two things. Two things. He wants to prevent you from receiving God's word, and he wants to prevent you from doing God's work. Those are the two things that the enemy is up against, to prevent your legacy and to stop the, he, he wants you to prevent you from receiving the word of God, from you hearing and being filled with faith and receiving the, the word of God. And he wants to prevent that good work that was planned for you before God even created you. He wants to prevent that legacy from continuing. His word and his work. So how do you respond? How does a legacy, legacy people respond to opposition? What do you do when you're rebuilding for God and you're under attack. Nehemiah shows us some things we're going to learn today. Number one, number one, you got to rely on God. Rely on God. Now, I know this is like easier said than done when you're in opposition. Because when you're in opposition, everything within you, the human tendency is to fight back. But the weapons of our warfare are not of this world. We don't fight like the world fights. We have divine power to demolish strongholds in Jesus' name. So you can't fight like the world fights. When you are experiencing opposition and those enemies are against you and there's rumors and ridicule and resistance. and op- When you're feeling it, you got to rely on God. Nehemiah, in Nehemiah 4, he shows us again. Nehemiah is a prayer warrior, man. Every step of the way, when he faces an obstacle, when he faces opposition, he goes to the Lord in prayer. Nehemiah chapter 4, he says, Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Man, these people hate us. These are haters to your kingdom. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Come on, he's hot right here. This is, he's letting off some steam. He's like, get them, God. You ever pray like that sometimes? Like, God, they're trying to stop me from doing your work. Will you break it? Like, you know what I mean? He's just letting off some steam here. That's all he's doing. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. He he says, don't don't cover it up either. Don't try to forgive them. Punish them, God. (laughs) He's mad. He's mad. Don't cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of of the builders of what you've called us to do. See, when you're being ridiculed, here's here's the principle. I think Nehemiah has shown us. When you're being ridiculed, don't suppress it. Confess it. Confess that thing. You rely on God. You admit it to God. Now look, he's, he's talking to God like that. He's letting out the steam to God. He's hot. He ain't talking to the other supervisors on the wall, going, going talking mess about everybody and, and mixing it up. He's not gossiping, and he's not getting involved in name-calling with them and, and talking about them and rallying people against them. No, no, no. He's relying on God. He's venting to God, okay? So here's, when, you're, when being ridiculed, here's the principle. When being ridiculed, don't take it out on people. Talk it out with God. This is what the enemy wants you to do. He wants you distracted, fighting the battle the world's way. Instead of actually fighting like a man of God, like a woman of God, and relying on God. Don't stoop to their level. Rise above it. Rely on God. Pray. Proverbs 26 and 4. I'm just trying to help you. This is what you do when you're in opposition. You're facing it, okay? He says, do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Okay, if you're getting ridiculed and you're going to answer back, he's saying you're no better than the people ridiculing you and opposing you. The best response to the opposition and to ridicule is no response is don't even, don't get involved in the name calling back. You just go and pray and keep doing what you should be doing. You keep working, okay? That's the first thing. When you, how does a legacy person handle opposition? One, you rely on God, okay? Number two, respect the opposition. Oh, what does that mean? What do, I don't want to respect the opposition. I don't like the opposition. Here's what I'm saying. 
You can, some of you, you, you know that there is a, you pray about it and you're like, oh God, help me out with this thing. And then, you, and then you think you're doing the godly thing and the faith thing by acting like it ain't even there anymore. You pray about it and you submit it to God and then you think you're doing like the faith thing by pretending you don't have an enemy who's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking to whom he may devour and you're not respecting the opposition that is against you. How do we know that Nehemiah respected the opposition? Look what it says in verse nine. But we prayed to our God so he relied on God and posted a guard. Someone say post a guard. You, look, you do the rely on God thing, you do the prayerful thing, but then do the practical thing. Right. Hey, when you lay in bed and you go, God protect me from burglars, that's great, but you better get up and lock the door. <laughs> okay? So here's, here's Nehemiah. He knows there's opposite. He's relying on God. He's praying. He's saying, God, you alone, you alone. And, but, he's, but he's also posting a guard day and night. I love this, to meet this threat. See, he ain't hiding from the threat. He doesn't act like the threat ain't there. He's posting a guard ready to meet the threat. Hey, don't act like the enemy isn't after your kids. Post a guard and meet the enemy at the gate against your kids. Come on. I'm going to, you want to come at me? Come at me, devil. You'll find me right here. Come after my kids. I'm going to meet you right here. You're going to have to come through me to get to my kids. You're going to have to come through me to get to my legacy. You're going to have to come to me. You better post a guard. To meet the threat, respect the opposition. You're not doing anybody any good by acting like it's, it's not there. So here, legacy people, legacy people don't just petition, they plan. So you pray about it, but you need a plan for it. The enemy is scheming and attacking your legacy, your children, your marriage, and you pray about it, but then you act like it ain't there. You ain't got no respect for the devil. You don't got no respect for the opposition. Rely on God when you're being opposed, but respect the opposition. And, and listen, the stronger the opposition, the stronger the response. The stronger the, the guard needs to be on the post, the, the more ready he needs to be to meet the threat. I love how it says, but we prayed. Because up to this time, Nehemiah had been doing all the praying himself. For four chapters, we've been seeing Nehemiah just praying and praying. Now, all the people are praying. Where did they get this idea? They've been watching their leader. See, legacy people lead by showing, not just telling. So look, if you are the leader of your family, you're the leader of your business, you're the leader of your team, and you want to make an impact on those people that you are leading, you better start praying. Because legacy people, they don't just tell, they show. We're going to model this. Nehemiah's constant prayer life, it affected the other people. So he posts a guard. He sets up an alarm system. I'm telling you, there's been a lot of people who have lost because they underestimated the opposition. They prayed about it. They knew it was there, but they acted like it wasn't a real threat. They acted like your kids aren't going to school and being attacked by the enemy and being offered drugs and viewing pornography, you pray about it, you know it's there, and you ain't got no guard. You got no one at the gate. You got no one meeting the threat. So what do you, you rely on God, but you have to respect the opposition. You know, in the Bible, there's this phrase that happens over and over again. It's watch and pray. Jesus said it. John said it. Paul said it. Peter said it. It's all throughout the Bible. Watch and pray. You see, watch is the human part. Pray is the divine part. Watch is the lock your door. Pray is God protect me. Okay? Watch is what I can do, right? That's, that's, that's my part. Watch is the human part. Post the guard. Pray is the divine part. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to trust you, God. So rely on God. Rely on God. Respect the opposition. And then number three, reinforce your weak points. Everybody's got them. Everybody's got some weak points. How many of you here got some weak points, some weaknesses? Where are you at? Where are you at? Those of you that didn't raise your hand, that's your weakness. There it is. I found it for you. I found it for you. There you go. Your, your biggest weakness is right there. It's you not knowing you got a weakness. Because when you don't know, if you don't know what your weakness is, then you don't know where you need reinforcement. And so you keep getting tripped up by the same thing. 
You keep getting tripped up by the same pornography issue, by the same gambling issue, by the same addiction issue, by the same, you, because you got no reinforcement because you don't admit that you're weak. You got weaknesses, man. We all got weaknesses. You need to reinforce the weak points. Verse 13, come on, are you guys receiving this? You getting something out of this today? Therefore, he says, I stationed them, some of the people behind, look what he, the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places. See, he didn't put them when there was, where there was like a 10 foot, 15 foot wall. He put them where there was the rubble, the two feet, the, expo, the strategic placement of reinforcement. So if you know that's your problem, how come you don't got software to protect you from it? How come you don't have, if you know that's your problem, how come you don't have an accountability partner? How come you keep going there? How come you keep doing it? You got to reinforce the weak points, you guys. That's how you handle the opposition. I love how he says, and he posted them by families. He posted them by families. This is a recurring theme all throughout Nehemiah, but legacy people don't fight alone. They don't fight alone. You're not going to leave a legacy alone. You're not going to fight. This is one of the, the purposes of the church, man, is you have brothers and sisters to help you to fight with you against the strategic opposition that you're facing. This is why we have groups at Discovery and why you need to be in a group. We were just looking at it this week. We have 63% of our church in groups, which is, which is awesome. That's great. I'm so proud of you guys that are leading, that are connected, that are making a priority of not doing this alone anymore. But what, I mean, I'm proud of that. That's great. But what it does also show me is 37% of you are still alone. And I, and I sense it. As every time I preach on Sunday, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to minister and encourage and uplift and, and, and like equip you and point you to Jesus and stuff. But I feel, in, I feel it. I feel the weight of it. Because I know on Monday you're going you're gonna to go out and you're going to battle again. You're battling at your workplace. You're battling at those, you know, when you go over to your family house. When you're battling at school. And, you're, and many of you are getting beat up, man. You're getting beat up. And you come in again and you're all bruised and bloodied and... And you hear the word, you get filled up a little bit again. Like, okay, okay, I'll go back out and fight again. But you're living Sunday to Sunday and you're doing it alone. You're doing it alone. And legacy people, people that are going to leave a legacy, man, they don't fight alone. Verse 17 and 18, it says, Those who carried materials, look at this, did their work with one hand and held a weapon with the other. Oh, I love that picture, man. I love that picture. Man, they're going to continue to work in one hand, but I'm going to protect my family with it. With, with, I'm going to hold a weapon in the other hand. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side while he worked. I love that picture. Here's the principle. Legacy people know how to build and battle at the same time. Okay, you cannot stop building to fight the enemy. You got to learn how to keep building and do the battle at the same time because you can, if you continue to get off your wall and fight that battle and stop rebuilding, then you'll never actually finish the work. And the enemy will keep you distracted and you'll just spend all your time putting out fires, putting out fires, answering the critic and the complainers and the kooks and, and all that stuff. And you will never leave a legacy if you keep getting down and fighting the battle, which you got to learn, is to hold a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other hand and build in battle at the same time. Yeah. Never stop. Don't stop battling, but don't stop building, build in battle. Number four, what do you, how do we respond to opposition? Reassure, I wrote it down like this. Reassure your people. I know we're in a rebuilding season. For a lot of you, it's different though. But this word is prophetic. Like this rebuilding is prophetic. And a lot of you are rebuilding in different ways. Here's what I want you to do. In your notes, just replace people for whatever that is. Replace, replace people for, because some of you are rebuilding. Some of you need to say, I need to reassure. When I'm under opposition, I need to reassure my wife. I need to reassure my husband. I need to reassure my kids. I need to reassure my family. I need to reassure my team. I need to, re like, like whatever that is that, that, that you are rebuilding, that the enemy has caused brokenness and destruction and damage in this season, that you need to rebuild. Hey, it, this, is, this is how we handle the opposition, how we respond to it. We got to reassure those people that we're protecting, that we're rebuilding. Verse 14, look what it says. After I looked the things over, I stood up, Nehemiah, and stood and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of these guys. How? How do we not be afraid? Remember 
the Lord. Hey, where do you get your confidence from? Do you, so do you get your confidence from, from when you're successful, when everything's okay, when, when, when it's going good, when you're on the mountain? Or the, like, like, here's what Nehemiah says. You, you can not be afraid, not because everything's going well. The way that you establish courage and confidence in your life is not by remembering who you are, it's remembering who God is. It's not by looking at who's up against you. It's by remembering the Lord who is great and awesome. My God is, so I, you can either focus on the opposition or you can focus on God. And this is the tactic of the enemy. He wants you focus on the, he wants you focus on the wrong thing instead of remembering who the Lord is. Okay, so you can either focus on the, the financial situation the financial turmoil, or you can focus on God. You can either focus on the last argument you have with your spouse, or you can focus on God. Amen. You can focus on the last mistake that you made and where you slipped up and messed up yet again, or you can focus on God. And the enemy wants you focused elsewhere, but here's what Nehemiah says, no, no, look, we gotta, don't be afraid. Be, be, be strong, be courageous, remember the Lord. And you know that word afraid, don't be afraid in that previous verse, in this word awesome right here, it's the same Hebrew word. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. The word is yare. It means the fear of the Lord. Here's, here's what Nehemiah is saying. The point he's saying is when, when you fear God, you will not fear man. When, when you fear God, then you're not going to fear other people. The fear of God replaces the fear of man. But listen, if you don't fear God then you will fear man. And if you do fear man, then you will not fear God. Now, I'm not talking about the fear of God like a cowering fear, like he's gonna punish you fear. I'm talking about Yare. He is great. He is awesome. There is a reverence. There is an awe. That's the fear. That we need to remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and that will evaporate all your fear because your God is for you. Who can be against you? Amen, somebody? So you got to reassure your people. And then he says this, fight for your families, for your sons and for your daughters, for your wives and for your homes. Here's the principle. Legacy people, they regularly remind themselves what they're fighting for. You have to remind yourself that this is worth it. That what this, uh, this fight is worth it. The pain is worth it because everything is riding on this. Everything is on the line. If we don't rebuild this marriage, then the enemy is one. If we don't rebuild this, my faith, if I don't rebuild my walk, then I'm gone forever. No, it's worth the fight. You got to regularly remind yourself of what you're fighting for, for. Fight for your family. Fight for your wives. Fight for your husbands. Fight for your children, your sons, and your daughters. Everything is on the line. Your legacy is on the line. That's why, number five, refuse to quit. How do we handle the opposition? You just got to put a stake in the ground, man. Refuse to quit. Verse 15, when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all partied and <laughs> went all home. No, no. We all returned to the wall each to our own work. There's still work to be done. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna rest easy now. I'm not gonna skate through this thing. See, we know there's opposition out there. There are critics, they're ridiculing, they're rumoring, but that doesn't matter. We're gonna keep on keeping on. We refuse to be distracted. Here's the principle. Legacy people don't quit. If you wanna leave a legacy, legacy people don't quit. Calvin Coolidge. He said, let me read you this quote. He said, press on. Nothing can take the place of persistence in your life. Talent won't do it. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with an abundance of talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts that amount to nothing. Persistence and determination alone are the overwhelming power. Don't give up. How do you handle opposition? Refuse to quit. Let me close with this. Nehemiah chapter 7. Kind of alluding to where we're going next week. The wall is, is going to be finished. 
How do you finish the work? How do you get to the finish line? What can we learn from Nehemiah? 52 days, man, got to the finish line. Nehemiah chapter 7. It says, after the wall had been rebuilt, and I had set the doors in place in the gates, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were all appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was, check this out, a man of integrity. You want to see God's favor and promotion? Be a man of integrity. Be a man of honor. Look what it says. And fear God more than most people do. Your standard of Christianity, of what it means to be a man or a woman, is not the person sitting next to you. Your standard is the Word of God. See, he's, he, this, th these guys, they didn't create their standard based upon everybody else. They fear God. They had this awesome reverential, my God is great and awesome, not because of the people around them, but because of who God said he was in his word. On, I said to them, look what he says. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be open until the sun is hot, while the gatekeepers are still on duty. Have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts, some near their own houses. So here's what the Lord was, was revealing to me as I was studying this, that in this rebuilding season, a lot of you have been hurt, have been wounded. There's been destruction and damage. And you're rebuilding, but listen to me, you can't just rebuild walls. You have to, re, you have to install some gates. Some of you have, because of your hurt and pain, you have all you, you tried to insulate and protect yourself and wall yourself off from any, any, from ever being hurt again. There's no access from people. There's no vulnerability. There's no transparency. There's no, here's really what I'm going through. There's none of that because of the pain that you've been through. You got no access points. You have no gate points. And even God, because of your walls, isn't impacting and influencing your life as much as he could be because all you've built are walls. Here's what I felt the Lord say, that you need walls to protect, but you need gates to prosper. See, in this, in this time, the city gates were actually important to the city. Like that was where all commerce, all trade, all access to the city was done through the gates. Some of you have no gates. You have no access into your life, whether by God or other people. And, you, and you've done that to protect yourself. But in this rebuilding season, I just wanna encourage you at this point, is this, at this halfway point, let's rebuild the walls, but don't forget the gates. Can I pray for you? Every head bow, every eye close, right wherever you are. God, we thank you. We thank you. Here's, in, in the book of Revelation, the Bible says, Jesus, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup or eat or fellowship with him. If some of you are here today and you feel the knock of Jesus. You hear it, you sense it, you've built some walls, but he's at the, he's like at the wall, he's at the gate, he's knocking. He's, he hasn't forgotten you, he hasn't left you, he, he's still pursuing you, he still loves you. He's saying, let me in, let me in. For some of you, you've never done that. You've never let Jesus into your heart. The Bible says this, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. For some of you, that may be the, the first time to make that kind of decision, to let God into your life, to let Jesus in, to be your Lord, meaning he's now in control. I'm surrendering. I'm surrendering. There's a new Lord. I'm letting a new Lord come and sit on the throne of my life. I'm opening the gate. Come on and take your rightful place. Seated on the throne of my kingdom. I'm, I'm surrendered to you. Some of you need to do that today for the very first time. Others of you need to do it again. But I'd love to help you make that decision today. With every head bowed and eye closed, online as well. If you're here, if you're listening, I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single you out. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, I just want you to lift up your hand if you're ready to surrender the control. If you're ready to open the gate and let Jesus in. Don't try to do it alone. Let him in. With every head bowed and eye closed, if that's you, come on. One, two, three. Be bold. Lift up that hand right now. If you're on chats, I need Jesus. Type it in. Lift it up. Lift it up. Come on. I need I'm letting them in today. Yes, 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 
Yes, yes, I hear the knock. I'm opening the door right now. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, all over this place. Yes, 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 amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and put your hands down. Will you pray something like this? Say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Today, I surrender the control. I open the gate. I invite you in to be my Lord and my Savior, my God. Change me from the inside out. Thank you, God, for saving me. God, I pray over every person right now that we wouldn't get too comfortable in this world, in our circumstances, that in this halfway point, God, that we would not get discouraged and give up, that we wouldn't let fatigue and frustration and fear and failure set in. But right now, God, I pray for a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit as we are rebuilding our family and our marriage and our faith that nothing would stop us, God, that we would rebuild with all our heart, that we're not giving up, God. We're not giving up, God. Help us, Lord. Fight for us, God. Not only are we going to pray for it, there's an enemy who is real. God, we're posting the guard. We're reinforcing some weak points. We're not going to get undermined again by the same schemes. Help us, God, to reinforce the walls. Help us, God, to get some accountability, to get some community, to get some protection that we would leave a legacy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.